Methodist Church. I'm so glad to have you here this morning. What a blessed day. Hey, it looks like we're going to get some rain. Who all got rain this just a couple of days? Well, actually, the last couple of days. Yeah, almost everybody. That's great. Everything's not quite as brown. You ordered that, Paul? We would like to thank you for that ahead of time. It, it, it really worked out well. We'd like to say hello to those people who are joining us via the internet. Uh, welcome to The Rock. Uh, we appreciate your support. We, we appreciate you being with us in, in the numbers of people that are worshiping and also those of you who contribute. What a blessing that is. If you would, bow your heads with me and let's start with an opening prayer. Heavenly Father, you blessed the first disciples with the power to spread your love throughout the world. Make us willing to receive that word as it enters our daily lives. Give us the power to proclaim your word through the gracious gifts of the Spirit. Bless all who use their talents to share you and share you in message and in love. Guide those of us who send the message so that all people will hear it and come to know your word and your truth and be renewed by your life. Father, we pray that these words are in the name of Jesus, and we pray these things with our, with our full hearts, completely wanting to live in your will. And we praise these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to The Rock. <laughs> if y'all would like to stand and join me in the call to worship. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his. Also the sea is his, for he made it. And his hand formed by the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. He is our God. And we are the people of his pasture. And sheep of his hand. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to stand and pass the peace amongst yourself. Please stand for the glory of pottery. Please be 
seated. Good morning. Almighty God, you are the King of kings and Lord of lords, the great I am. You hold the authority in heaven and earth. We come before you to accept the responsibility that you have put in our lives. You have ordained what we, have de what we will demonstrate Christian leadership in our homes, church, and workplaces. Raise us up to be the best followers that we can, we can be. Be our guide in the dark and the light. Help us bring our hearts to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. First reading, 1 Chronicles 19, 1 through 5. In the course of time, Nahash, king of the Ammonites, died, and his son succeeded him as king. David thought, I will show him kindness to Hanan, son of Nahash, because his father showed kindness to me. So David sent a delegation to express his sympathy to Hanan concerning his father. When David's envoys came to Hanan in the land of the Ammonites to express sympathy to him, the Ammonite commander said to Hanun, do you think David is honoring your father by sending envoys to you to express sympathy? Haven't his envoys come to you only to explore and spy out the country and overthrow it? So Hanun sized, seized David's envoys, shaved them, cut off their garments at the buttocks, and sent them away. When someone came and told David about the men, he sent messages to meet them, for they were greatly humiliated. Please stand as we sing, leaning on the everlasting arms. The second reading comes from 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 8. I urge, then, first of all, that peti petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peacefully and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed at the, to at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. This is the word of the Lord. A reading from Philippians chapter 4, 5 through 9. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, be by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, 
thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Please stand as we sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness, and remain standing for the Gospel reading from John. gospel reading today is from John 21, 15 through 18. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of God, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else 
will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. This is the word of the Lord. your promise you play on repeat in my head when you meet my anxiety put it to bed never run into what I can't see fighting Thank you, Callan. <clears throat> well, once again, welcome to the Rock United Methodist Church. We're so glad that you're here. You probably noticed that over the last several weeks, we kind of had a, had a phase thing going on. We've been trying some of the, talk, to talk about some of the more difficult things that we have to do with our lives and, and how we see things and where those things are going. Today, the title of the sermon is Communication Breakdown. Now, communication is hard sometimes. Some of us just don't do it well, do we? Sometimes we get confused. Sometimes other people say things that we don't hear. But we have to keep trying because that's how we exist as a society. So I'm going to tell you a little story. So a kid was attending a youth basketball game here in Texas, and, and when the coach asked him what his name was, the kid said, my name is Weed. He goes, oh, okay. And the coach says, well, this is Austin. That is a little bit weird, but okay. And so he called him Weed for three days. Anyway, at the end of three days, parents came to visit, and, uh, and the coach was a little embarrassed when he met the kid's parents because it turns out the boy had a speech impediment, and his name really was Reed. <laughs> so, so he called him Weed for three days. Communication, it's difficult. In 1 Timothy, we're told to live quiet and peaceful lives in godliness and holiness, and we try and do that. We want to please God. We want to come to truth, and we do that through communication. Truth is only worthwhile if it is shown to others. You can know the truth inside yourself, but if you don't share the truth, then other people don't know the truth. Then we read Philippians 5, 9, and, and what they're telling us there is that we should show gentleness in every situation and through 
prayer and petition. Petition's an interesting word. If someone asks you to, to sign a petition, they're asking you to do something specifically. They want you to be on their side. There's something, and this is the same thing God is saying. Through prayer and petition, through repetitive prayer, through repetitive asking, you be able, you're able to communicate with God. You give thanksgiving, and, and when you ask enough, you get what you ask for. Famous writer George Bernard Shaw said, the biggest problem with communication is the illusion that it actually takes place. He understood how things didn't work. Our major Bible study today, uh, before the gospel, is in 1 Chronicles, and it also appears in 2 Samuel. It's the same story. King David, who was now the king of Israel, very strong guy, he'd united the two sides. King David decided that he was going to honor another king down the road, an Ammonite king, who had been very respectful to him, but now he'd passed away, and his son had taken over. So King David says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send some gifts. I'm going to send some people. We're going to go respect this king. Now, this king was known for being a strong military leader. So once David's people got there, the military told their king, they said, ooh, these people aren't really here to, to say nice things about your dad. We've all heard stories about them. These must be spies. So this new king, this youngster, the one who had not done any communication with David so far, had them all arrested. He had them shaved. And remember at the time, having a beard was a sign of, of actually being a mature man. He had their clothes cut away all the way up just above their behinds, and then he sent them home. Well, they were absolutely humiliated. It also humiliated King David, who was trying to do the right thing and building structure and trying to, to help. He was... His intent was to communicate to the new king that they were also going to have the same alliance that he'd had with his father. But his message didn't make it because of the fear that the people had when the, his envoy or ambassador showed up. So his men were humiliated. It was a bad decision for the Ammonites because after that, David put together an army of, 47, uh, of many thousands and killed 47,000 of them. Surely only for the lack of communication. So how's your communication? Are you doing pretty well now? Are you hearing the kinds of things that you should? Are you listening? Are you active listening? Do you ever miss anything in a conversation? You know, when we're distracted, we can really miss some important things. We really need to learn to pay attention when somebody is talking to us individually. Posture, inflection, body language, all of those things are a part of communication. When someone talks to you via the internet or, just, or texting, you don't get to feel those things. You can get yourself in trouble. They can say something and you don't know what they really meant by it. So you have to pay close attention. Little things mean a lot to some people. For instance, in an Arab home, if you go to an Arab home, you don't sit with your legs crossed. Why? Because if you show them the bottom of your foot, that's an insult. Can you imagine? That's not something that we would do here, but that's an insult. In some African cultures, you don't meet people eye to eye, at least for a long period of time. When you shake hands, you might meet eye to eye, but after that, you, you don't stare them in the eyes. Why? Because they think it's aggressive. It's an aggressive form of communication. So we need to pay attention to these fine things that we do, especially when we're out there in the world trying to encourage people to come to church and to become Christians. Now, how about at home? And I say with some of this tongue-in-cheek, but it is true, women and men speak a different language. They speak the same language differently. Let's put it that way. Women speak 20,000 words a day. Men speak 7,000 words a day. And there's a reason for it. It's been studied at University of Maryland and at Oxford University in England. Women have a much higher level of something called the FOXP2 protein. That protein is the language protein. That helps them develop this ability to speak and to communicate. So as a result, women usually speak at a much younger age. They, they create sentences earlier. They have larger vocabularies. And they have more complex sentence types. And I had I looked, looked that up. I hadn't really paid any attention to sentence types for quite some time. And I looked that up, and there are simple compound complex or complex compound sentences. Well, women are ahead of us men in all cases. 
Now, they more accurately reflect voice inflection, intent, and small facial movements. They're focused in that direction. Harvard psychologist Robert Rosenthal says that, that men don't receive these cues as well as women. Men don't send them, and they don't receive them. Men recognize different things in speech. They're looking for problems. They're looking for mistakes. They're looking for opportunity. They're looking for an opportunity to st- solve issues. Men digest speech to find the very shortest answer. We want to solve problems rapidly. Women want to share their feelings. They want to sort them out. They, then they can find solutions. Men gather information from the speaker and from the environment. They scan it, sift it, and look for inconsistency, omission, and dangers. Men pay attention differently. We're going to see a little, a little film here. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me. And I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there... Stop trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing... You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. See, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail out... See, you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just... Sometimes it's like there's this achy... I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on! Ow. If you would just don't <laughs> try to see things my way, do I have to keep on talking? To- Fellas, ever been in this position? Yeah, some of us have. You know, but the funny thing is that women focus where they should. Like I said, in the face, the tone, the intonation, the body language. They take the whole message, whereas we are looking for the solution. Women get people to open up more than men do. Women psychologists do do very, very well in helping people find what they need to heal. Women walk away from a conversation knowing more info than we do. That doesn't mean they're perfect. Sometimes... Sometimes men miss what's happening, but sometimes men miss what's happening because women speak in code. You ever seen that? Guys, did you ever come home and your wife's upset and you ask, you say, honey, darling, sweetheart, what's the matter? She'll look at you and say, nothing. Okay, this is the number one lesson, men. Pay attention. Nothing means something. This is the calm before the storm. Men don't communicate like that. You need to try and understand. It's time to pay attention You may feel the need to ask what's wrong right there. If she says nothing and turns her back on you, you're going to have to become Sherlock Holmes and James Bond all at once. You're going to have to study the situation, figure out what's wrong. Was it her appearance that changed? No. Her outfit and hair, they're exactly the same? Yeah. Did you miss an important function or a date in your married life? No. Did you not do something that she asked you to do? You run down your list. No? All right. It's not about us. <laughs> so, so you rack your brain, and you know you didn't do anything, but, but maybe, maybe it isn't about us, and maybe we're safe this time. So we finish our analysis, and we might ask very sweetly. Previously, we said, Is there something wrong? Now we ask sweetly, so what's not wrong, honey? And suddenly they'll pour out everything to you. All you can do is try and keep up. Someone sometimes give them that encouraging, "Uh uh-huh, okay? (laughs) But if you don't commiserate, if you don't try to understand, if you 
if you just listen and don't do anything, they're going to consider you, if there's no feedback, distant and stoic. Now, I will tell you, I will admit, I like being stoic. I do. I think it makes us strong and mysterious, but, but they don't. Ellen used to tell me, she, she would say, you are the least communicative people, person I know. You are one of the most uncommunicative people. I thought it was compliment. I was like, oh, yeah, all right. You know, <laughs> that's good because in my line of work, it wasn't something that you did all the time, just throw out your entire life out there. Well, here's another hint about communication. If your wife storms in the house, smacks her keys down on the counter, and asks, is there anybody who can do anything right? Men, that is a rhetorical question you are not supposed to answer. Do not immediately say, sure, the, uh, no, don't do that. It means, a rhetorical question means you're not supposed to answer. The other thing you don't want to do is turn the TV up louder, right? No, because it's not going to make things go away. She wants you to listen to what she's saying. You can't say everything's all right to her because we can't dismiss her feelings. They're different than we are. She's not the problem. She has a problem, and she doesn't want you to solve it. She wants you to hear it so that she can solve it. Here's another example of a communication difference. The word fine. Fine. It's a simple word. There's fine dining, there's fine wine, there's fine art. When men say something is fine, we like it. It's good, it's clear, it's understood. I'm agreeable, I'm appreciative. It's fine. When she says, how does this look on me? And you say, fine. Although what you really mean is you look nice. She, it's not what she hears. She hears that you're anxious to get going and she's met the minimum standard. <laughs> When a woman says fine, it's the last word in a conflict. They are done talking to you. You've wasted enough of their time, and now you should go somewhere and be quiet. Here's another one. When they, when they do that compound sentence, that's fine, go ahead. Oh, well, when men say that, it means we agree with you. You convinced us. We understand now, and we're moving forward. When women say that's fine, go ahead, it's a dare. They are daring you to do what you just said you were going to do. She wants you to feel the pain of the stupid decision you've just made. It's hard. It's hard to figure them out. But she deserves that you, believe, that you deserve the consequences of your actions. She's already kind of figured out how you're going to pay for your mistake. She's looking ahead. How about the word whatever? When men say whatever, we acknowledge that some ideas are better than ours. You might be right. Let's try it your way. It's a way that we save some of those 7,000 words that we have. When we're thinking to ourselves, whatever, we're thinking, sure, you can paint the living room green. We can move the grill. Life is good, whatever. When she says whatever, especially if she uses both words as in whatever, you have been labeled foolish and the conversation is over. These are words that you just never, ever want to hear. You never want to hear the, that, you know, whatever, because that means that you've done something wrong. Now, here's the worst. When they make the triple complex compound sentence, that's fine, go ahead, whatever. That's the nuclear football code of, oh, no, you're in trouble. It's the marital apocalypse. You need to run. You need to get away. You need to go fishing. Don't go to sleep right away because something bad's going to happen. She used all her code words at once. Now, listen, I'm making light of communication, but it really is a, a very serious subject, especially when it comes to our knowledge of Scripture. Communication fits very well into this gospel story that we just read. The story of Peter, Simon Peter, and Jesus after Jesus had been resurrected and he's at the, at the Sea of Galilee, is very, very important. Because Peter always made mistakes. Yet Peter had this deep love for the Lord. But they were not reconciled at this point. They hadn't talked about all the issues that Peter had had. Now, when we read this Bible, if we read a common English Bible, an NIV Bible, or one of the others, we may not hear everything that we're supposed to hear. Quite honestly, if you don't do some background studying this, you may not understand what's going on here. But what happens is that, that Jesus sees these men out in, the, out in a boat. 
It's early morning. They, he calls out to them. He says, have you caught anything, men? And they say, no, we haven't. And he tells them, he said, throw the, th throw the nets over the other side. And, you know, they're not thinking much about it, but it, it's not, they have nothing to lose at this point. So they go ahead and do it. And when they do, they catch 153 huge fish. Why 153? Theologians have been trying to figure out how important that number is for the longest time. Nobody's actually understood it. But they catch 153. It's so much that they can, they can hardly even haul them in. They get to the shore. Simon Peter jumps out ahead of time, and he rushes to the shore, greets Jesus. He recognizes who he is. The others come, and Jesus has already prepared breakfast for them. So then on an open fire, they've got some fish cooking already, and they've got bread. Well, when's the last time you ever had a really, really tough conversation? It was kind of joyous while they were all together, but, but things are about to change because Jesus pulls Simon Peter to the side. Peter needs to be questioned about his behavior. We need to know where Peter is. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus pulls Simon Peter aside, and he asks him, pay attention to what he asks him. He says, Simon, son of Jonah... Do you love me more than these? Now, that's been debated by theologians for years. Do you love me more than what these? Do you love me more than these fishermen? Do you love me more than these words? Do you love me more than these other apostles? Do you love me more than these? The other important thing about that is what? He used Peter's old name. He used Simon. Before he had remember, he said, Peter, you are the rock. Peter, Cephas, you are the rock I'm going to build my church on. Now, this would not have been lost on Peter. It wouldn't have been lost at all. He must have been immediately hurt, thinking that this was an issue. Perhaps, he'd, perhaps he was getting fired. He wasn't going to be the rock of the church. Jesus asked Peter if Peter loves him more than his brother disciples. And he uses an interesting word. He uses agape, agapos. We all know that agape love is universal love. It's that love that, that is the perfect, wondrous love, agape love. When Peter replies, Peter uses the word philios. Yes, Lord, I love you. I philios you. And that really makes a difference. Agape love is universal. That strong, un, that strong, constantly binding love. Philios is, you know, yeah, I've got affection for you, Lord. Agape is, I'll defend you with my life. I will take a bullet for you. Philios is kind of what you'd hear at a, hear at a, at a fraternity. I love you, bro. You love you too, bro. That's Philios love. It's not a serious love. It's, a, it's, not, it's an affection kind of thing. Agape love is when Jesus describes, when he says, love God, <laughs> love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbors as yourself. That's agape love, you, this universal love for other people. But Simon Peter, who has, who has three times denied Jesus and has made all kinds of other mistakes, is now reply, replying, not agapos, but philios. Now, perfect love may seem an illusion. We know it, it's a hard thing to put our hands on. It's intangible. It's often unattainable. None of us probably has experienced Chris, the kind of Christian love that Jesus is talking about. Although many of us have agape love for others, we, want, we have a, this universal love. This universal love can be just an, a power that cannot be even slowed down. It seems like something that we should be searching for in our lives, and, and most of us are. But Peter, the same one who denied Jesus three times and abandoned him, replied to him, Yes, Lord, you know I have affection for you. Kind of like, yeah, you're my man. Hmm. He doesn't really answer the primary question either. He said, do you love me more than these? Peter never addresses that. Now, he doesn't claim to love Jesus more than he loves the others. He doesn't even claim to love Jesus completely. And this is going to be the disciple who's going to be, who has been chosen to spread the word of the Lord in Jerusalem. He knows Jesus is the Messiah. We've heard him say that earlier in the book of John. Peter also knows that he failed the test of faith. He must have been absolutely humiliated to have to be in this conversation with Jesus. When Jesus asked me, do you love me more than these other men? 
Jesus is asking him, am I first in your life? Am I first in your life? Peter doesn't respond well to that question. Jesus stops that initial part of the conversation by saying, feed my lambs. Within minutes, Jesus asks a second time, perhaps a little slower so that maybe Peter will understand. He says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He didn't include the other guys this time. He asked the question differently. Do you love me? Again, using the phrase agapos. He's asking, do you love me perfectly, fully, and without reservation? Once again, Peter replies, yes, Lord, you know that I love you like a brother or friend. So Peter's not really communicating with Jesus understandingly, or he's holding something back. There is an issue here. Now it's become a mild interrogation. Jesus is trying to get Simon Peter to think about where he is and what he's doing. Now, knowing Simon Peter, knowing what we know about him, knowing how we've studied him over all these years, you know, he, he may very well have really been carrying a terrible burden here of guilt. He knew he had been chosen, and he knew he failed. Maybe he doesn't feel worthy of telling Jesus that he loves him with agape love because he has failed him. Maybe Peter's afraid of his own death. Perhaps he still doesn't even really realize what agape love is. Maybe he's never known it. Perhaps his reply is a humble recognition of knowing that he's failed. See, we, can't, we don't get inside Peter's mind here, but these things have been, been thought about and, and ruminated about for many, many years. What is Peter thinking when the Lord asks you, do you love me, agape? And you say, yeah, yeah, I love you. You're, I have affection for you. Peter isn't seeing the future, perhaps because he didn't have much part in the in the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. He wasn't there. He was the second person that got to the tomb, but he wasn't there when Jesus arose. I imagine Peter's not sure he's still the rock that Jesus is going to build the church on. I think he's probably struggling in his inner self with with how much he has done wrong. And this rough, tough fisherman is going to have to become a little vulnerable here. He's going to have to figure out who he really is. Because Jesus is, in fact, preparing him for a monumental task. When Jesus ascends, Peter is going to lead the church in Jerusalem. He is going to be the nidus of that church. Much like the members of this church are the nucleus of what we're doing and spreading out. That's what Peter was doing, but he was doing it for God. Jesus asks him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? But this time, Jesus uses the same word that Peter used, philios. The third time that Jesus asks Peter, he changes from agape to philios. Do you love me? He uses the same word Peter has. He lowered the love standard. He lowered, he's no longer asking for this perfect universal love. He's just saying, you know, do you love me? This subtle change is very important. That kind of love is going to have to be important, is going to have to be significant enough for Jesus at this point, because Peter is not completely prepared. Peter replies, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. His answer is better. Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus told him, feed my sheep. Jesus told him, be my shepherd. Jesus has reconciled with Peter at this point. He, after after this mild inquisition, after these three very tough questions, he asked him, now Jesus is saying, I want you to be my shepherd. Now, Peter knows he's been a failure. He knows that he failed when he was walking on water. He knows that he cut off the serpent's ear at Gethsemane. He denied Jesus three times and, in fact, cursed him. He wasn't present for the crucifixion. He wasn't present for the resurrection. But Jesus is now prompting courage and conviction in Peter. He wants Peter to get up and do something. Jesus communicates in this last question that Peter is, in fact, restored. When Jesus changes the question, Peter has an epiphany. He was distressed because Jesus has changed his 
word for love. He thought, oh, wow, things are getting worse. But Jesus and Peter both realized that Peter just can't claim that agape love yet. So how does that relate to us? Are you, where are you? Are you in the filios relationship with Jesus or are you with the, in the agape love? How's your communication with the Lord? Are you talking to him? Are you, are you sending questions out every day? You know, I, I know sometimes we, we don't actually know what to say to the Lord, but you know, just being quiet sometimes and thinking about those things is important enough. Being committed to Christ is meaning continuing to understand what he does for you all the time. You know, to communicate your personal faith, you don't need to be a scholar or a theologian. You just need to feel it in here. You need to be able to go out into the community and feel your faith because you know that you're saved, and then th now you want to go help save someone else. Remember, we're simply saved by salvation, by grace, because we have faith. Like Peter, though, we really do need to make choices. We need to make the right choices. We can embrace the Lord with whom we communicate, or we can do the bare minimum. We can let others feed the sheep. We can roll around in our self-doubt. We can live in our past failures. We can refuse to adapt and overcome. That's what Peter had done to this point. Or we can hitch our pants up, drive on, meet the challenges, and become a shepherd. Now, I know what my choice is. Do you know what your choice is? Do you know how you're going to do that? Do you know what you're willing to do to do that? I pray that you do. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. I've got peace like a river, and you know they cannot sing this song without a smile on your face, so... <laughs> Let's smile when we sing. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got So this week as we depart and as we begin then to communicate with those that are outside of us, pay attention to what people are saying. Look at their, their body language, their, the tone of their voice. Hear the things that they're trying to say. But more than that, do the same thing with God. In your prayers, when you're feeling those, Im those important things that, you, that you've begun to communicate with the Lord, look for a response. Look for what he's saying to you. Look at ways that he is trying to help you create more of you in this church. May the power of God the Father, the love of Jesus Christ, and the help of the Holy Spirit be with you until we meet again. Amen.